You're getting the idea of what we're up to today. We're trying to figure out different ways in which if you took David seriously at his word, um, the, uh, that we do need wider perspectives and not just in, in painting, but across the board, what would be involved. So I, I promised that I would spend about 20, 25 minutes setting the table, both for people who were here yesterday and who weren't here yesterday. And uh, the person who I wish could have been here today and who really wanted to be here today was Rebecca Solnit. Uh, she is famous to many of you as the person who did the infinite, the map of, of San Francisco, the book about the maps. But uh, I love her work for all kinds of reasons, but I especially love her book, River of Shadows, Edward Muybridge, and the Technological Wild West. And I used it as a template for thinking about the rest of the, of the sessions. And I'm going to give you a little sense of what she said. I'm now drawing on her. She's in, she, it happens that, she, by the way, she's just done a, map of, a book of maps of New Orleans. So she, she left yesterday to go to New Orleans. Damn. Um, but anyway, so, so make believe I'm Rebecca. Uh, and her book begins, uh, basically, by pointing out that, uh, and she's not the first to have done this, that between 1830, or if you, if you go to 1835, Five years to either side of 1835, three inventions come online simultaneously, basically. Uh, and they are the train, the telegraph, and the camera, or, or the photographic uh, chemical camera. Um, and as she points out, and again, she's not the first to point this out, that with that, if you think about it, suddenly you have trains going much faster than any ever gone. You've got telegraphs going across incredible distances almost instantaneously. You've got the camera being with images. In her words, everything else is commentary. That basically, that is the fulcrum moment in history, the, the, uh, the history of the modern era. Because from there, you're going to go, you, you can get cameras that will eventually become television. You can get telegraphs that will be telephones. You can get trains that will be planes. But it's basically, suddenly, you are leaving the local. You are leaving the world in which, basically, you were limited by where you were to the life you had there. She also points out that at the very beginning of that moment, in 1830, Moybridge is born in Kingston-upon-Thames. Uh, I was looking all over the internet for a photograph of, of him as a baby, and I was just going crazy because I couldn't find one. I said, wait a second, of course I can't find one because the camera hasn't been invented yet. Uh, <laughs> but there's some pictures of, of a male child that he would take later on. Um, so anyway, so she points out that in 1830, he is born at the very beginning of this astonishing moment. And then she fast flashes forward to, uh, I mean, there's various other things that happen in the book, but for my purposes, what's interesting is we get to 1869, where you had the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and the thing that's interesting about that is that you now have a train that is going to go from New York to San Francisco, uh, and you'll be able to do the, the trip in six days or five days as opposed to six weeks. And, and the thing that let it be known that it was happening, that it was about to happen, I just want to make sure we're okay. Turn off the lights a little bit. Uh, are you okay? He's, okay, never mind, we're okay. Um, anyway, the thing that, uh, is that you may not know about, the hitting of the golden spike, supposedly, you'd have the train coming from both sides, and then you have a golden spike uh, that is the last nail to set up the train, is that this was the first intercontinental happening. Because one of the things you did with a train, the only way you could make trains work is you had to have telegraphs. And so they had telegraphs hooked up to the spike going in, and they had large crowds in San Francisco in the public plazas, in Chicago, in, in Philadelphia, in, in New York, all of whom simultaneously in real time experienced the fact that this thing had happened. And it was the first national happening. It's parenthetically a uh, whole other stream is what leads to time zones, if you think about it. Uh, uh, it. It used to be that time was local, that that every town was exactly the way it was supposed to be, uh, uh, that it, the noon was solstice on the day of uh, the set of the highest on the solstice, but that would mean that uh, towns 20 miles apart might be three, three or four minutes off from each other. It didn't matter when it was just villages but no, or, or horses, but now suddenly, if you had a train, this was literally the case, if you had a train going from New York to Chicago, it had 17 clocks on board for the 17 different places it had to stop. And 
again, now I'm, 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 uh, uh, I'm off my story, but I'll just tell this one last thing, that they had a conference to settle this, uh, to set up time zones. And it takes, so this is 1869, and it's caused by transcontinental train traffic that you need to have this. And they decide at a, the Treaty of Washington, 40 country, 44 countries are there, 43 countries are there, and they decide that Greenwich will be zero degrees, and that, uh, and that there will be all these time zones, as, as we know. And the vote for that is 42 to three, uh, 43, 42 to one. One country does not go along. Do we know which country that is? France. <laughs> which insists that Paris, that the observatory of Paris be zero degrees. And that's, and it is, it remain, I, I have a whole set of slides that I'm not even showing you, but, but that it remains zero degrees France in Paris until 1914 when they need to coordinate with the English troops coming over. And then they finally grudgingly, okay, we're going to send 500,000 troops, we'll give you time. But, but, uh, but uh, that is parenthetically why Man Ray, when he does that famous painting of the lips floating in space, and there's the observe, it's called the Hour of the Observatory. There's that observatory down at the bottom, and that's because for him, Lee Miller, the lips, has just left, and he is at zero degrees. Uh, anyway, long story. Coming back, <laughs> coming back to that golden spike. The person who hammered that golden spike was one of the robber barons who had put this whole uh, thing together, this, uh, and, and, the, and railroad barons were unbelievably profitable things once they got going because they had monopolies and so forth. And that guy's name was Leland Stanford. He is the one who na nailed the thing. And he then retired to his, uh, his dacha, his villa in Palo Alto on the Leland Stanford ranch. Uh, and having done more than any single person to have made horses obsolete, he did what all such people do is he started raising horses for racing. Um, in the same way that once we kill off all the Indians, we put them on our currency. That, that sort of thing is common in history. And the story goes, and it's complicated. There's various things here, but but at one point they have a bet. You know, does the horse take, have all four feet off the ground? And they need to figure out how to do it. And he hires this guy, born in 1830, who's now in San Francisco at that point, named Moybridge, to come and. And uh, there's some discussion whether it happened before or after. But in any case, the general idea is that Moybridge, on the Leland Stanford Ranch, what is now Stanford University, does this incredible series of motion, stop-motion stop uh, images, um, and of all sorts. And Rebecca Solnit, who calls her the book uh, Edward Morbridge and the Technological Wild West, sets it up very much in counterpoise to uh, the book The Metaphysical Club that was done a while earlier that said that Harvard University was the center of the world. Ha! We say to Harvard University, ha! Uh, Obviously, California is the center of the world because from those experiments that took place on the Leland Stanford Ranch, of course, according to Rebecca, and I agree, two amazing streams, which will define our time, Hollywood and Silicon Valley. Hollywood, and if you think of Hollywood, obviously, but digital in terms of taking continuous motion, breaking it into bits, looking at the different bits and so forth. Uh, Silicon Valley being exactly at the place where these experiments had happened. Anyway. So um, that is the Rebecca Solnit part. Now I want to summarize some of David Hockney's work uh, that also will set the table and then bring this all together. Uh, I looked at, I went online uh, looking under Google. Somebody from uh, Peter maybe will be able to tell me later how to do this. But I said, Photo, uh, photos Hockney child. Photos of Hockney as child. Photo, da, 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 da. And what I got, I love this. I wish David were here. It turns out that there is a whole line of clothing that has child mar actors dressed as David Hockney. <laughs> Nothing is too wonderful to be true, as Michael Faraday said. Anyway, that stands in for him having been born. And he is born in 1937 in Bradford, which is to say that he is born 98 years after the invention of the chemical pho photograph. He is born 107 years after Moybridge. Uh, and he is a, wonder, a wunderkind, a boy wonder, uh, and very, very quickly uh, establishes himself uh, with, with this sort of painting uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, 
uh, comes to California and so forth. And I'm going to zip right past the, the bulk of that early period of his life uh, uh, to this incredible series of paintings that he does in the 70s, which are the kind of defining his work for a while. Uh, this sort of painting, these, uh, these amazing portraits uh, that are generally based on, on one point perspective, if you think about it. And these are paintings that he could have gone on doing for the rest of his life. Uh, and his dealers would have been very happy people because uh, they were very, very popular. Um, and, uh, and interestingly, when he was doing them, he was often using photos uh, as, as, uh, as, uh, uh, as guides, as sketches. But he was finding that they, precisely in the way the twins talked about earlier today, they warped at the, fr at the top and the bottom. So he found himself, for example, doing that to be able to do this. Uh, and he continues doing, and he continues doing, and he continues pressing. And to make a long story short, around 1980, his most ambitious of these paintings yet uh, is the view across the street uh, from his studio on Santa Monica Boulevard. And he works on it for years, and it's a failure. He can't do it. There's something wrong. There's something that's driving him crazy. He knows that something's wrong. Uh, and he is going to spend the next several decades trying to figure out what's wrong, and increasingly coming to feel that what's wrong is one point perspective itself and the tyranny of the optical that we've been talking about. Early on, what he does is he starts making the famous Polaroid collages. And uh, he is trying to get a sense of what it is actually like to look at something. If, the, if these two people, uh, Don McCarty and Chris Fisher, were in front of you, you would, in fact, not be staring at them with the optical stare of a cyclops. You would be looking down, looking up, you'd be looking aside, you would be putting your, the world together in much the way, again, that the twins talked about how we put the world together uh, and why we don't see two thumbs and so forth. We're putting all the things that are in focus and in our memory we're consolidating it into one thing. Uh, he was quite aware that he was playing with Cubist type of ideas. Uh, and then presently he went from these uh, Polaroid collages uh, although even then, and this is by the way when I first got to know him, he was talking about how great it would be able to do, to do this with video. The cameras were too clunky, the technology was way, way too clunky at that point, but he had that in the back of his mind. I'm sorry, this is 1982, 83, uh, generally that, and then it, we're into the 83 here, where he's no longer using a grid of Polaroid tiles, but he's taking pentaxes. If you think about how the Polaroids worked, by the way, uh, this one here, for example, he had to move around all over the place because the Polaroid had a fixed lens. And to get the back of the room, he had to go behind her to take that Polaroid and so forth. And he had to slowly build it up. And in fact, here, he was in fact built. This is Bill Brandt and his wife. Uh, and he is, in fact, building up this very image on the floor. But to be able to show what he's building up, he did some photographs of himself. But in fact, they're looking as he is building up the image. And, and sometimes it doesn't work. It's not quite right. He moves it over a little bit exactly the sorts of things he'll be la doing later on when he's doing the videos. But later on, he starts using pentaxes. And, and with them, uh, he can stand in one place. He can zoom. He can, so forth, and he can take lots and lots of pictures all at once. Um, in this case, his mother um, at the place where she and, her, uh, and his father originally dated. Uh, and uh, you see his feet at the bottom there. You get these amazing, and one of the things that everybody does this now because of, of him, but this is, was, when he started, extremely difficult, and it's still extremely difficult, actually, because you're really drawing. It's all about line. You, you just can't throw things together and so forth. And, and how do you create a sensation of the lived moment? My book about David Hockney is called True to Life. How are you true to life in a way that just doesn't look chaotic, that this doesn't look like it's a giraffe with 10 eyes, <laughs> but rather looks exactly the way Billy Wilder lighting his cigar and coming up for conversation would look. I, I would argue parenthetically that the really important, uh, uh, if I can get this to work, yeah. That's the important frame. And that, by the way, establishes that he's there, that David is there, that, he's, that there's a dinner conversation going on, but also it gives a whole sense of depth and so forth. And it's important that it's out of focus compared to what's in focus. Um, Anyway, and then, and then you begin to move fur further on along. You, you get what we were talking about earlier, uh, reverse perspectives. The idea with this one, he's experimenting with, it's obvious. But, but if you stand over here, you see this, and you see this. If you stand over here, you see that, and you see that. You know, and, and how can you get more information, getting exactly away from the thing about the five-year-old boy, you know, 
who, who that we were talking about before, who gets it all wrong because he includes everything. But if you do reverse perspective, he then starts bringing this into his his uh, his paintings, where you can see going to visit Don and uh, Christopher and Don. How you come uh, down the road, you come down the steps. You can see it, when you're on the road, you can see that thing there. When you're in the different rooms, you can see it again through different windows. You walk. He, the characters are transparent, so when you're in this room, you see him. But as you leave, he he just becomes part of the pattern until you see Don over here. He has the same view over there. He's trying to construct that kind of thing that the five-year-old finds natural. You eventually get to the masterpiece of the photo collages of Pear Blossom Highway, uh, which has such detail, which has such a sense of what it's like to be in the place that it leaves in the dust a photograph taken the traditional way of exactly the same place. Um, and so forth. He realizes at this point that it, although he has, just fit, he has just taken, you know, probably, uh, Gregory's here can tell us, but it, it must have been close to several hundred thousand photographs over that, over that four or five years, maybe close to a million photographs. In fact, he can't stand, he, it's photograph, photography itself that's the problem for him. And he's trying to find ways out of the vice of the optical. He tries, for example, uh, stage design, where a single image has to work from all different sorts of perspectives. Uh, he then returns to painting, having learned the lessons from stage design, and he is giving you, this is actually a two mile stretch of road if you're going through Sledmere, uh, and he shows you all the, the different horizons as you come to each point. It is the fact that you know you're coming to town because you see that little thing over there. You come down, there's a right turn. You see, uh, here you see this this way, but then over here you see that. It, 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 you get all kinds of different things, and then once you're out of town, you zip off and there's these stacked horizons even more so in this one, for example, where, uh, where you know, the v once you get to here, there's that horizon. Once you get to there, there's that horizon. Once you get to there, there's, you know, and this is beginning to be reverse perspective, which is making the scene open out, culminating in what, in what to my mind, is the masterpiece of this series, which is uh, coming over the hill, uh, and, and you can tell that you're driving in that picture. You can tell you're in the passenger seat, of a car, actually it's, it's England, so you're in the driver's seat, of a car that has just come over the hill and is suddenly having this view open out before it. You can tell that the wheels, the back wheels are on the far side of the hill and the front wheels are, are starting to go down the front. You have this incredible sense of, of spaciousness and so forth and so much of it is based on reverse perspective and having broken, this is not at all what a photograph from this place would look like but it is what the world, it is true to life, it's what it feels like. You get pictures like this where you're both looking down and looking up, things that a camera could never do, um, and so forth. Moving along quickly, you then get to this point in, uh, where he has this famous epiphany, uh, um, where he's uh, at the anger show, uh, and he is convinced this is shows the, of, of these drawings that anger had just polished off in an afternoon when people, when the English people were coming through Rome on their grand tours, they'd sit for him for a little while, and he would just polish off this thing here. And David became convinced that he had seen this line before, this sort of thing. And he said, where have I seen it? And he suddenly realized that's Andy Warhol's line. Now, when Andy Warhol is doing that, it's, it, it is because Andy Warhol has projected onto a, a slide onto a screen, and he's drawing on the screen. But what's, what is Anger doing? And he becomes convinced that Anger is using a camera lucida, he tries it himself. He eventually, all sorts of things to make a long story short, he creates his, his uh, big, the Great Wall. What he does is he has a tremendous art library. He has a color Xerox machine. He puts it in the middle of his studio. The studio is the size of a tennis court, which is what it used to be. Uh, it's two stories high. So the length of a tennis court he has from 1300 to 1900, roughly, uh, and it's northern Europe above, southern Europe below, and just takes his color uh, art books and starts shingling the history of Europe, uh, of European art, and he notices, here's a detail, and by the way, the Great Wall is here, you can go look at it, but he notices that something happens around 1430. There's no struggling to get there, it's just there. And it is indeed, as Charles was saying yesterday, as if Europe had put on its glasses. And then the interesting thing is, coming out the far side, uh, in 1839, up till then, art is getting more and more photographic in a certain sense, but once you get to 1839, artists suddenly don't have to do that anymore because photos can do that. 
and art falls away and awkwardness returns. And you begin to get all sorts of things that are much more uh, like what was before. So the reign of the Cyclops, as he puts it, is that period uh, in, in painting is the period from 1430 to 1839, roughly. But the cycloptic view, the optical view, continues with a vengeance in our lives. Magazines, television, advertising, everything is in a rectangle, everything is one point perspective, being swallowed when you go to movies. Um, and he still feels that wider perspectives are needed now. And that way of looking at the world is itself the problem, as far as he's concerned. So he tries various things, and now I'm just going to zip through because this is the show. You can go look at it, but he, you know, he tries watercolor, which you can, by definition, not be optical for reasons that I won't go into right now. But you get this incredible series of watercolors, followed by he then starts making paintings again. That, and one of the things that's interesting with many of these paintings is that he takes the trope of the one-point perspective, the road going down the alley, but he moves it to the side, and you get all kinds of things that happen with uh, with perspective when you begin. Uh, rolling things around. The same scene, th these were done very, very fast. This is done at 6 o'clock in the morning and this is done at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then eventually he starts saying, but it's still a problem because it's still, he wants to break that up, he wants to do bigger paintings, but he also wants to have multiple perspectives within the paintings. He starts making these grids of the same place at different seasons. That's nine of them there. We have four of them here in this show. And to see how far he's come, you can see the difference between this painting here that he did in the 70s of three people, two of them sitting and the other one having gotten up to paint the painting, looking down the vice of one point perspective, and this. And one of the things that's happening in this one is that time is moving. You, the, sh the shadows are changing across the picture. Uh, I mean, again, just look, look at the difference. And the thing that's interesting about David is that even if he is doing a deep critique of, of technology, he is at the same time not at all averse to using technology. And as you know, he does this remarkable series of iPhone drawings. I did a portrait of him when he was doing a portrait of me. Uh, he, by the way, is, these are done with his thumb, not with his finger, with his thumb. The iPhone drawings are done with his thumb. The iPad drawings are done with his finger, which is to say with his, with his wrist or an elbow, and the paintings are done with his shoulder. So it's, so it's the wrist and the thumb, elbow, and so Anyway, the, you, so you see obviously all these great, I won't go into detail, and then uh, he becomes Tarzan-like and declares that he can draw on an iPad. Not only can he draw an iPad, but he is working on cutting edge ways of blowing them up. And you'll see some of the drawings there that are just you know, huge, huge drawings. It's amazing how well they hold up. Um, and at a certain point, and now we're coming to the end of what I want to talk about, he gets the idea. He says, wait a second. You know, video has now gotten small enough, the cameras, and the screen's brilliant enough, and the technology, it's a really software issue sophisticated enough that I can go back to those Polaroids and do that experiment. And he sets up nine cameras either on the front of his car or on the side. He readjusts the malls. He does all kinds of rejiggering and eventually creates those amazing, uh, in this case, nine. And then when he puts two groups of nine together, 18 point perspective uh, videos. Uh, and you know, you know, you've been at the show, so you know what they're like. And they are deeply, deeply, deeply absorbing. And it seems to me that this work, and for that matter, much of the work we saw this morning, much of the stuff we talked about all along, poses a challenge. Um, you know, if this is true, if he would make an argument, and I think you can disputed in some sense when you go look at some of the stuff, that that is truer to life. There is something incredibly immersive, something that is incredibly involving. In, in the essay I did with him for the catalog, he talks by contrast, and he just takes at random a film, The Hobbit, which what ought by all measures, and there's several hundred million of them, uh, uh, be the most immersive thing you can see. But it just isn't, because you are continually outside of it. 
you're being, it's moving so fast, you're being directed to, you, one of the things that's quite wonderful about the others is you're be, you can choose yourself what you're looking at, uh, your eye can move around, whereas here you're, you know, in the Cyclops vice of, of uh, Peter Jackson telling you what to look at at each particular moment. You don't ever w spend any time uh, just lounging in the experience and so forth. And it seems to me that David would argue that this kind of thing that he's thinking about stretched away from simply the metaphor of, of the optical and the visual to the, to the metaphor of how it is to be in the world and whether we are gonna be able to continue to be in the world uh, all the way out to you know how, how we can experience the world that we avoid global warming and a number, number of other things. Um, this is the heart of what he is up to today and the challenge that he is posing. And I wanna now go back to Rebecca Solnit and, and her observation that Moybridge uh, feeds in two directions, one way to Hollywood and one way to Silicon Valley, one way to Hollywood and one way to the digital. And I thought for the rest of the day we would, uh, for the next two panels, we would have one panel of people working in Hollywood uh, to talk about the challenge that they may themselves be feeling. And then we'll have a second palette and all of people working more in Silicon Valley, broadly understood. Uh, and then at the very end of the day, we'll have kind of a Donnybrook. There's some extra chairs we can bring out and we can all play. So with that, I'm going to stop. And I, uh, this is basically going to be a conversation, except that uh, of the uh, three people, we have uh, John Gaeta, who uh, was involved in, in the Matrix films. We have uh, Dennis Muren, who is uh, with Gaeta at, at uh, Industrial Light and Magic. And, and we have Florian von Donnersmark, the great director of the lives of others and the tourists and many other films. They've all been thinking about this a lot. The only one who has an actual presentation he wanted to show you visually was, was Dennis. So Dennis, uh, why don't you come up here and give your presentation and then when he's finished with his presentation, the rest of us will all come and sit down together and hash this out.